Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Zachary Kelly. I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies here at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm coming from you live in sunny Oakland this morning. Um, and I'm very, very excited to introduce Professor Tricia Starks um, from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Um, she is Professor of History. And um, today she is going to speak, us, speak to us about Soviets and cigarettes. Um, which will come from her forthcoming uh, manuscript um, entitled um, Cigarettes and Soviets Smoking in the USSR, forthcoming by Northern Illinois University Press. So later this fall, the book will be out so we can read about that later. Um, but her previous work prior to that, Cigarettes and Soviet, or um, Smoking Under the Czars, A History of Tobacco in Imperial Russia, came out on Corn Cornell University Press in 2018. Um, and then finally, The Body Soviet, Propaganda Hygiene and the Revolutionary State out of uh, UW-Madison, Wisconsin Press in 2008. She has also worked with uh, Matthew Romaniello and Allison K. Smith. Um, there's a forthcoming um, conference in 2024 in Toronto on general winter and the snow maiden, cold in Russian history and culture that perhaps I'll fly up to Toronto for that one. Um, that sounds exceptionally interesting. Um, she has done multiple works, multiple articles, um, a revolutionary attack on tobacco, Bolshevik anti-smoking campaigns in the 1920s for the American Journal of Public Health, um, and different translations, translator of the, um, of an editor of uh, UP Bokarov, Tobacco Production in Russia, the Transition to Communism, um, and then has also been successful in getting National Endowment for the Humanities grants um, for K-12 summer institutes, something that ICES also does um, for part of our Title VI grant. Um, so it is my pleasure to let Trisha Stark speak to us today about her topic. Um, Trish, please. Thank you so much. I, I, I think we're all, we already did all of our, our checks, so I think we're good there. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for having me and letting me talk about tobacco, because I love tobacco. I, and it's not just an esoteric love. I have to say that tobacco is an important issue. It's something that is important to the, the, the Russian experience today. It's not just history of tobacco that I study, but also the public health implications of it today. Russia today is one of the heaviest smoking countries out there. They've had great strides in the last five to seven years, but for most of the 20th century, Russia has been a major smoker and a, a, a group with large smoking populations. But this is kind of an intriguing thing because according to most ideas about smoking. Smoking is a capitalist function that industrial design and marketing are essential to smoking, that they are part of the reason that people smoke. Now we know that tobacco is addictive, that it has this biological pull, but even when we try and have people quit smoking today, and use nicotine replacement therapies, it, they still have a hard time smoking because there are all these psychological associations, social pressures, cultural ideas about smoking that bring you into smoking again and again. And, and these are things that we think of as being part of the capitalist experience, something that is part of marketing, part of industrial design. And so it's really kind of weird that we have so much smoking in Russia and the Soviet Union when we don't have those same things. So the kind of the central question of my work is how do you have smoking? How do you have so much smoking in an area where you don't have what are seen as the essential parts of smoking? What I'm gonna to do today is take you through a little bit about tobacco. I know you have not been studying tobacco for the last 20 years like I have, but I'm gonna take you through in a brief amount of time, some of that, talking about Western tobacco advertising and packaging, taking you through Soviet tobacco advertising and packaging in the 20s and 30s, transitioning in the 1960s and what happens as we have kind of a new Western style of tobacco coming in, and giving some general conclusions about what can that tell us about tobacco use in a general sense, in a global sense, and also what it tells us about the Soviet experience in, in, in more particular ways. Along the way, we'll talk a little bit about gender, we'll talk a little bit about the sensory, and I hope that you'll have some fun with some beautiful images. About 35 minute talk, pretty quick. I speak pretty quickly, and so I hope that that makes it feel kind of fun as we go through. 
but let's take a look at some beautiful pictures and start with Western tobacco. Now, when we think, oops, we missed one there, there we go. When we think about Western tobacco, when we think about tobacco in uh, the United States and in Great Britain, we think about imagery and posters and glamor, that sex and glamor, medical authorities like our doctor, doctor up there with his lucky, sports figures like Lloyd Wayner down there, these are the, the people that push tobacco in the West. And that tobacco advertising in the 1920s, in the 1930s, and especially into the 40s and 50s was a way to seduce people into becoming part of what one historian has called the vice industrial complex of American tobacco. That seductive appeals, smooth messages, enticing packages, all of these brought people in. Tobacco advertisers were at the forefront of Western advertising techniques. They're the first ones to give premiums, the first ones with color, first ones to use skywriting to invite people in, electric light advertising. These are all part of early tobacco advertising and all part of that enticement, product placement, sponsorships, all things that tobacco advertisers were in, uh, innovators in and important to the rise of tobacco use in the West. They also, though, were very importantly interested in, in the packs themselves. So not just these gorgeous advertisements, not just these gorgeous posters, but also the very little things that you take with you on a daily basis, that the packs were, were something that, that you could take with you. The image on the pack was an advertisement that followed the purchaser home, accompanied them through the day. They shined out in bars and restaurants, peaked from a pocket. In libraries, smoking rooms, they could be sitting there on the table, on the streets and in workplaces, in homes, in intimate gatherings, in drawing rooms. You didn't just have billboards, you had a cigarette pack right there with you. But the pack is more than just a signifier. It's more than just a visual contemplation. Packages are part of that addictive experience. Historian David Cartwright has argued that in his Age of Addiction of 2019, that bad habits are, are, are pushed by what he calls a limbic capitalism that is not just limbic in terms of the activation of our brains, but that is pushed by accessibility, affordability, advertising, and, and, and these, these changes of packaging themselves. Historians Gary S. Cross and Robert Proctor have pushed forward with that idea of the packaged pleasures to argue that the cigarette is the quintessential capitalist pleasure that they argue that there's an intimate connection between the sensory appeals of marketing and packaging that help create addictive experiences that people go back to again and again. When I think about a cigarette pack, I think about an explosion of sensory appeals. I think about the sight, the smell, the taste, the hearing, the touch that are involved in opening a pack of cigarettes. If we look at the pack itself, it evolves in time. This is not a static experience, but one that changes over time as technology develops. One of the things that you think about first when you open a cigarette or you feel first is the cellophane that goes around the pack, the sound of the crinkle, the pop of pulling that red um, bit of um, string that opens the top of the pack, the shimmer of the graphic over the pack from that plastic. Cigarette um, cellophane is a fairly new innovation coming out in the 1930s from RJR Reynolds in the use for their camel cigarettes. The foil insert is a newer, newer still innovation. It brings the cigarette up to the, the status of a Christmas package with its crisp shine and, and satisfying edges. The flip top box, the hard, cop, uh, hard pack, an innovation of 1954 from Marlboro again. The sound component of that as well, the satisfying click as it opens and closes. These are all innovations of capitalism that try to manufacture desire, create desire, to create something that you want to have. Not only do we have innovations that are part of the packaging of the cigarette that create desire and, and create addiction, we have changes in the cigarette itself. 
the blends within Western tobaccos of flu cured tobaccos that have sugars involved that uh, excite other parts of sensory experience of tobacco and other parts of the brain as you inhale, these make tobacco more addictive. By the 1930s, U.S. manufacturers are adding ammonia so that when you inhale tobacco, you freebase the nicotine so that you have like 90% of the nicotine enters your body within a minute after you start your first cigarette. This makes for a harder hit, a quicker addictive experience, and a more addictively designed product. But this is Western. These visuals are Western. These packaging innovations are Western. The Russians and the Soviets have an entirely different experience of tobacco. Let's talk about that for a second. Now, one of the major differences of Russian tobacco in the Soviet Union and then Russia before is they don't have these same industrial designers. They don't have Smoking in Imperial Russia is very different. Russia had both a late and um, er, a, a early start to tobacco that is different with a different experience than what we see in the West. They have a different internal tobacco. They have um, the use of what we call um, Mahorka tobacco or Oriental tobacco, two different types. And they also have this unique style of cigarette. I'm gonna hold one up here. There's one in that central picture there. It's called a Peperosa. It has a hollow tube here on the end and a little bit of tobacco here at the, at the, um, at the other end, uh, Gilza and a, um, a, a Peperosa together. These um, tobacco are early into Russia. Russia's tobacco is unique, unique in leaf, unique in source, unique in style of, of use. It is um, singular in delivery and it is early that they bring it to them. The um, Russians are smoking more and smoking, um, using tobacco as a cigarette earlier than most markets in the world. The Russian Peperosa makes it more addictive use of tobacco. Um, and by the 18, late 1890s, about half to most of Russian males are smoking tobacco or using tobacco on a daily basis. This use of tobacco in smoking is a much more addictive form of tobacco use than in other markets. In the United States in this period, most people use tobacco as cha or, or, or um, in pipes. These are not as addictive because they're not as quick a hit of, of nicotine. Not only do Russians smoke and have a more addictive experience of tobacco because they smoke, they also have a more addictive experience because their tobacco has higher nicotine content. The use of that oriental tobacco or that Mahorka tobacco makes for a more addictive experience. It's a nationwide habit well before entering into World War I, and it's a nationwide habit of smoking, which is different from most anywhere in the world. The UK doesn't get to half of its total production being into cigarettes until 1920. The US not until 1941. But Russia has over half of its tobacco produced in smoking cigarettes or in peperosi by 1914. So they're addicted earlier to a more um, dangerous form of tobacco than elsewhere in the world. It's a huge nationwide habit. It's a huge um, uptick in use. We see this in the use of brands. We see this in some early advertising, but their advertising is not nearly as prevalent as we'll see later in um, the US or in Britain. What happens to that existing tobacco market and when we have our Soviet revolution? Because the Russian revolution in 1917 is going to really transform the way that we look at markets, that transform the way that we look at um, consumption, transform the way that we deal with these kinds of um, consumer products. Advertising is going to change. Marxism is going to challenge our ideas about how does one relate to consumer goods. And we're going to see a 
different attitude there that is also going to affect the way that we deal with smoking products. Now, advertising is, it would seem an easy thing to just get rid of with the Russian revolution. Advertising is creating artificial value, disconnected from utility. It is what is called product fetishization. It seemed an easy thing to condemn, but Russia in 1917 and Russia in 1921 are fairly different. By 1921, the Soviets are having to deal with a new kind of reality of the new economic policy. As Lenin makes his temporary tactical retreat to capitalism, it's also going to affect the way that our Marxist Leninists relate to advertising. Cost, cost cutting that's related to the new economic policy and self-funding of government enterprises that are integral to this policy are um, going to go head up against advertising. And in 1922 at the 11th Party Congress, Lenin questions the idea of getting rid of advertising because he needs it or he sees it as necessary for helping things like Pravda to stay in business. Lenin pushes for the approval of advertising space and Pravda to allow it to stay afloat in an era of um, self-funding for government agencies and, and for different groups. This leaves forward the way for tobacco to still be advertised underneath the Soviets. And we see it in advertisements like this, this early 1917 to 1920 um, advertisements, we don't smoke senators, give us Soviets, where we have our nice burly man holding his pack of Soviet peperosi and also holding in just one hand our old style senator in his gold braid. <laughs> Now the 1920s in the NEP era allow this kind of opening for a little bit of bourgeoisie, a little bit of, um, of revolutionary advertising. And we see a mixture of both. We see this, especially in tobacco advertisements, we'll see the luxury that we would associate with it in the West in posters for tobacco brands here, like the tobacco brands out of uh, Vladivostok, or the tobacco brand Carmen. We see both males and females smoking, smoking in elegant attire, smoking in isolated um, privileged spaces and smoking in, in, in gloriously sensual ways. These bourgeois smokers are, um, this is the only place that we'll see women as active smokers in the Soviet era of, of visual in visuals of the Soviet era. And, and these are the, um, as opposed to our pre-revolutionary, we saw a lot of female smokers. The 1920s, the only um, active female smokers we see in advertisement are, are um, bourgeois females, but we see some bourgeois touches of advertising. Most of the advertising though, is going to take on the flavor of the revolution. Tobacco advertising in the 1920s allows you to smoke in revolutionary ways. This revolutionary advertising would feature active rail, male smokers celebrating tobacco consumption that they used in revolutionary, patriotic, or productive ways. They would um, enjoy tobacco as part of the revolutionary tri triumvirate. If you look over here in the Mohorka number eight um, um, from Nimkomuna advertisement, you see a Russian peasant, uh, a German peasant, a, a German commune peasant, a German Volkog peasant, a Soviet soldier and a Soviet worker all enjoying tobacco together in front of a red infused factory landscape. In the central for the um, Peperosi Nasha Marka, you see soldier, worker, um, bureaucrat and peasant, uh, the, the male in the red shirt on the far right, all enjoying tobacco together all part of that revolutionary triumvirate now making smoking part of the revolutionary tradition. Or in one of the best ads of the, the period, um, a um, advertisement for Peperosi Pachki, you see Masal Prom being advertised with this glorious Russian peasant, very excited to be riding his tobacco out into the world. These male smokers allow for red garb tobacco use, ads showing conscious communist consumers even as NEP showed the advertisements that retained a little bit of that bourgeois imagery with tobacco. The pre-revolutionary and the post are now brought together and allowing you to be a connoisseur of tobacco 
either, it, it, either as the bourgeoisie of the earlier time where you were all concerned with taste, or now as a revolutionary consumer or a communist consumer, where you can think about tobacco as part of the revolutionary lifestyle. That revolutionary lifestyle even goes down into the packaging. So we have, these are advertisements, these are poster advertisements. Let's look at one of those packages you could bring home. This is a 1920s uh, package for the Smuchka brand of Peperosi, 25 of them laying within. And it gives you a political message even as you open up your tobacco products. So Smuchka is a dual-sided pack and it is named after the Russian Peasant Worker Alliance or the Soviet Peasant Worker Alliance coming out of Leningrad's um, State Tobacco Trust. On one side of the pack, you see peasant. On the other side, you see worker. Together, they are creating a new Soviet future and together they are shielding your tobacco. Even as you would open this pack, you would be able to experience the, to, uh, the, the propaganda, understand the state message. Your tobacco consumption became part of a revolutionary message, a political um, uh, education, and a way that you could signal that to others. When you carried this pack home with you, or when you carried this pack into work, you were bringing an alignment of yourself and your consumption habits into the state's, um, the state's viewpoints. This is an amazing way to take a, a habit that is, tobacco serves no useful purpose. Tobacco is a consumable that does not give nutritional value. If this is a way to take something that is a luxury item and make it seem like it is part of a revolutionary system. It's an amazing twist of consumption into something that's productive, that is becoming part of the production of the political system that you are willing to be part of. And so production that is, a consumption that is productive is part of that tobacco experience of the 20s. Packs like this, a buyer could see a red infused world. They could signify to others their communist habits than their communist ideas. It educated Soviet consumption. Smoking becomes then a, a revolutionary habit. Now, smoking had already been part of uh, Russian, uh, Russian culture, right? I showed you that it was there before 1917. But after 1917, these kinds of advertisements, these kinds of messages transform it into something that can be part of the Soviet experience as well. Um, these uh, tobacco's addictive qualities help it to maintain users, but it's near ubiquitous use by soldiers, by people of the revolutionary class, cemented its status as a revolutionary habit. Tobacco had fueled the Red Army and had been part of um, uh, ration packs for soldiers. It had clouded the meetings of Soviets. It had been part of the, the imagery of the Soviet political image, uh, person. And now you could make that part of your lifestyle and kind of consume revolution. For youth, especially who had been shut out of 1917, tobacco use became a way to connect in with the revolutionary groups. And you see here, these are two um, uh, uh, surveys from 1929 from the Moscow Department of Health showing worker youth um, tobacco use in the late 1920s. And you see how many worker youth are smoking and also consumption of uh, uh, how much they are smoking in the two um, ones that you have before you. Medical figures are always high smokers. Um, this is an ongoing thing. There are a lot of reasons behind it. I can talk about that later. Um, but you see also that it's, it's a very much a habit that is associated with the most revolutionary classes, the railway workers, the intelligentsia, and um, with um, students of, 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 medical, um, of medical knowledge. This early onset really helps to cement this, um, this um, habit even without all of the things that we talked about as part of Western tobacco consumption and Western tobacco push. That doesn't say that the Russians, the, the Soviets don't have some of those same, uh, same incentives that we see in the West. They're just not nearly as sophisticated. They do have the packs that are beautiful. Here are two of my favorites um, packs from the 1930s, Stakhanovskaya and Svetofor. Um, these are both packs that speak to that beauty 
um, that you can see, but they were also very ceremonial packs. They're not ones that you see on a daily basis. They employ color ad, um, color advertising. They, the Stanakonovskaya has like metallic print as well and embossing. These are very expensive and fairly rare. Um, but you do see that kind of um, advertising coming home with people with two of the more famous brands of tobacco that come out in the 1930s, Bellamore Canal and Kazbek. These are the two, the, the, like the most famous brands of, uh, of Soviet paparossi. They are used throughout the um, Soviet experience. They emerge again in the 1990s as nostalgia brands. These packs become a way to carry along your use, to signal your style, to be part of a larger group. These are the most readily available to brands. They're not, they are the two most popular smokes of the Soviet era, and they both celebrate Soviet, um, Sovietness and Soviet um, engineering in the form of Bilaport More Canal or in the form of Kazbek, the Soviet frontier. These are efforts to bring together a feeling of nationalism along with smoking. And they are um, a way to bring a spiritual sense or a, 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 an intellectual sense to your smoking habit. These are peperosi that are fairly rough. They are not um, about quality, but about quantity. And they make them fairly available. You see there also how you would smoke a peperosa. So I showed you this, this one, or this is an earlier version, this is a longer one, but you would pinch your filter and that's what forms a filter in a Russian cigarette is just pin, pinching, pinching the um, gills up. Not really much of a filter, but there we are. The advertising of the 1930s is, it kind of disappears. We have a little bit of packs, but we're absent the marketing incentives of NEP, which discontinues in with the great turn of Stalin. There are many fewer posters and the posters that we do have are fairly prosaic. They're just about how does one use tobacco. They show cultured use by having um, cigarettes in ashtrays or peperosi in ashtrays. We have here one for even a cigar from Sever, but they're not as inventive as our 1920s posters. We do see the packs though is still being very pretty. Our derby pack on the left with its bright red and that's a Mayakovsky design or our parade of packs below, including Wrestler, Yava, um, extra and Derby again, all of these beautiful packs that are used throughout the Soviet period. I have a brief moment here just for World War II to say that in World War II things go bad, not surprisingly. The fields of war are also the fields of tobacco uh, production. That's where most of the tobacco leaf is from either um, areas of Ukraine or Southern Russia. These areas are overrun but they will actually move some of their tobacco factories, but it takes a long time. There's a massive amount of destruction of tobacco factories, but there's also mass addiction and mass use. There's so much use as part of World War II that we have a, a fairly strong rise in the amount of smokers after World War II. Resurrection of that industry is gonna take some time, but what I wanna end with, and when I wanna take you through, at the end here is the transition into a more Western style of smoking. So after World War II and into the late 50s, we start on the heels of Sputnik to see a Soviet tobacco production that is finally resurrected. Tobacco availability became a sign of good times, a sign of stability, and it was part of the post-war agenda to make more tobacco for more people. Khrushchev promises to bring society um, to communism within 20 years and consumer goods are part of indicating that recovery. Meat consumption rises, automobile production increases. This continues with Brezhnev and part of all of this is tobacco. Mass increases in the amount of tobacco that is available to people on a daily basis. By 1970, it's estimated at about 34% uh, that about 60% of males and about 30% of females are smoking. And it's just rising in certain areas. In areas of Kiev, it's uh, or in Kiev Oblast, it's into the 60s and into the 20s as well. This is done without advertising, without advanced manufacture. Tobacco is just a sought after item and its demand far exceeds its production. To get rid, to, to try and meet that, production issue, Oop, 
Where'd it go? Ah, sorry. To try and meet that production issue, the Soviets have to end up importing vast amounts of cigarettes, much of them coming from Bul Bulgaria. Part of increased tobacco use was also better quality Western styles. These um, cigarettes that are coming in from uh, Bulgaria are going to be largely made along Western lines um, in their mass and number. From 1960 to 1975, we go from an importation of 10 billion to 71.4 billion sticks to the Soviet Union from Bulgaria, meaning that from 1966 to 1988, Bulgaria is the world's largest exporter of tobacco to satisfy the Soviet market. Viga and Rodopi and Bulgar Tobacco, these are some of the more um, popular forms. These join Soviet attempts to westernize their cigarettes like Yava a filter there that appear as a way to try and satisfy a new style of tobacco use that follows in that idea of competition with the West of having a cultured style of tobacco use. Things really take a turn in 1964. Even as the Soviets are struggling to meet demand, Americans are beginning to see a downturn in 1964 and American manufacturers move towards the Soviet market as a promised land, a place where smokers want more and more, but can't be satisfied, that the state can't keep up. And so Philip Morris, in the same year that the US Surgeon General Report is issued on smoking and health, turns its eyes towards making the Soviet Union a new market for their production. They see a bountiful number of smokers and an inability to supply them, and they had great hopes that they could be the ones to do so. They will pursue in a series of different um, overtures, a mission to Moscow, according to one, an Operation Red Carpet, all of these documented in um, memos and some secret papers that are part of the Master Tobacco Settlement that is held at um, UC San Francisco. They will start to push forward for getting a Marlboro onto the Soviet market. In 1975, Philip Morris, Morris negotiates an agreement for a joint, joint production of this cigarette here called Apollo Soyuz. It is named after the first space mission that links up the two, the Soviets and the United States. This joint space mission is now celebrated as a joint tobacco mission. The Soviets have all sorts of problems putting together these cigarettes. They are produced at Yava, Moscow, but because the Soviets don't have the quality control or the machinery to do them, Philip Morris basically sends them the bulk tobacco, the paper, the cellophane, everything to create these cigarettes. But for the Soviets, this is an amazing uh, win to have a Western style cigarette with all of the trappings that they can produce and, say, and, and sell on the world stage. Philip Morris predicts in internal documents that it's gonna be a global loser, but their end game is to get Marlboro onto the ruble market, which they do in 1976. Now bringing Marlboro onto the ruble market is a huge deal because Marlboro are the most engineered cigarettes in the world. They are the world leader of use in that period because they have the quickest nicotine, the sweet sugar, the immense advertising budget behind them, and they enter the Soviet market like gangbusters. They have a soft entry first through the um, foreign stores, through the Biryoski, and you can see them kind of appear as a, um, a, a special thing in, in films like here in Ivan the Terrible uh, uh, Changes Professions. Um, he's singing a song about good times and he turns around and shows off a Marlboro cigarette. The same thing happens if you watch um, Slujebny Roman, um, Office Romance, they have um, Marlboro cigarettes are part of the, the plot line of how you get past the secretary. Marlboros appear in all of these places without any of the marketing that are, is associated with their needs in the West. They don't have advertising in the Soviet Union at this point. They don't use advertising of tobacco products. They discontinue any kind of so tobacco advertising in the late 1960s. They don't have to advertise though to get Marlboro out there. Marlboro is already is an accepted standard of the best kind of tobacco out there. This enters into a market where desire is so, so strong, but supply is no longer there. 
is not able to meet demand. I like to say that the, the Western manufacturers um, manufactured demand, Soviets barely met it. And so that's what we're seeing with tobacco, that they're manufacturing demand elsewhere. They bring it to the Soviets and Soviets just want it, desire it so much because they don't have enough tobacco of their own. When Marlboro comes out, according to the director of the Yava factory where they are produced in the Soviet Union, if these cigarettes had come out in general sale, I think they would have drawn lines no less than McDonald's. Their scarcity added to their charm, making them one of the most sought after consumer products of the late Soviet period. Marlboro must have been a revelation to anyone who could have gotten hold of one. Compared to the harsh experience of a Mahorka Peparosa or a, an Oriental tobacco cigarette, these were smooth and sweet. They gave a huge jolt of nicotine. They had the packaging that was pristine white papers, tobacco that stayed in the tobacco, in the peperosa rather than falling into your mouth, smooth um, feel of cellophane. These were a more biologically addictive, psychologically compelling, um, delivery intensive tobacco experience than anywhere else. And in a world of scarcity, these were the goal. This, do, while domestic blends would stay the major form of tobacco use in the Soviet Union up through the 1980s, in the 1990s, there's an explosion. I conclude with this picture of the last days of the Soviet Union to bring together the mystique of two major symbols of power, the Pushkin Square McDonald's, which opened in 1990, and a family of five enjoying a day out in the city and using a Marlboro cigarette as their prop in the middle of it. Marlboro becomes a central character in their big day. To be modern was to have fast food and fast nicotine. And within the year, the difference of Soviet market marketing would be obliterated. By 1990, there's massive cigarette shortages that occasion riots, attempts by smokers to block Gorbachev's motorcade, um, and transnational companies fill in the gap. In 1990 and 91, 34 billion cigarettes are sent to the Soviets by Philip Morris, RJR, and other major tobacco ma manufacturers. This mass importation of Western cigarettes seals the deal and seals the changeover to a new Western style of addiction. By 1996, after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, we have a huge number of smokers in the, Russia, in the areas of Russia and the former Soviet Union, somewhere between 65 and 73% of males and around 27% of females. But the big issue is their amount of consumption. Now they are consuming far more. Some uh, um, former Soviet Union countries have consumption increases of over 50% in the wake of 1991. All that pent up desire and demand is now met finally with supply. This leads to horrendous health outcomes. By 1994, the average age of male death is 57.5 years, and the average age of female death is much farther behind the Western, its Western counterparts. This is largely due to cardiovascular disease um, and smoking-related illnesses alongside those of alcohol. These two killers together mean a huge difference in the way that um, Soviets and then Russians experience health and tobacco. I hope that was interesting for you. I hope it was a little different. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Trish, thank you. Um, round of applause probably from everyone coming around. I found this massively interesting and based on some of the questions that have come in, um, you've definitely kept an audience for the whole time explaining this. Let me ask one question just as some more people will be um, probably typing questions as we speak. Um, and I'm gonna pull one of the questions um, out of here as well. So were health warnings ever printed on Soviet era cigarette packs? And let me add one line to that. When, do you know when the Russians put like the big white and black, you know, the European standard? Um, in the, Okay, in the sense that Russia or the US, we don't have that yet. So just a curiosity, if you could speak to that a little bit. Yes, um, that's a great question. And the um, Soviet manufacturers start um, putting, at, uh, putting warnings on cigarettes in the mid 1970s. Yava is the first one to do it. And they do it not because the government tells them to, 
but because there's pressure from popular groups. So in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, Literatur Naya Gazeta, Zorovia, um, I'm trying to think of who else. Um, there's another big one that's uh, putting out kind of, ad oh, Crocodile. Crocodile mm. does a huge thing about the dangers of tobacco. And now this is like 10 years after the Surgeon General's report, 10 years after the College of Surgeons in Britain have put out their warnings, but it's coming from readership and coming from people in editorial positions that this push towards more tobacco restrictions. And so Yava Tobacco, the, the, they start at putting on a, a very simple, you know, smoking is dangerous to your health on the bottom of their Yava, their cigarettes. And they are, they're really scared of it. They go out to see what's gonna happen. Oh yeah, there's all sorts of extra pictures I'll get you to in a minute, if you want. Um, and they go out to see what happens. And the people, when they buy the warning cigarettes, their only comment is, is this gonna cost us more because it has the warning on it? Um, it was just the most, it's the most Soviet reaction to uh, everybody bought their full pack, everybody, but they, they do start warnings earlier. And they also, um, one of the things that I don't get to in here is that they start the first national anti-tobacco campaign in 1920. Mm. They have the first national anti-tobacco campaigns in the world. Um, they don't do, it doesn't work, it doesn't take, but man, they do start early. So that's a great question. And yeah, these later, after 2000, they start to really do the anti-tobacco work. In the last five years or so, they're claiming, and it looks pretty good from what I've seen, they're claiming to have reduced smoking by about 20 to 30%, so. That's good news. Um, yeah. Based on my experience in 2007, 2008, where it felt like everyone, their mother, brother, and son was smoking with you. Yeah, no, it's not like that anymore. You can't smoke inside, you can't smoke in cafes. They don't have it for sale in kiosks. It's, it's a lot harder to find a smoke now. Interesting. Um, so another question that came in, a key part of what makes smokers and smoking and the industri industry so offensive for this person is that it tells a story in which people are victims of their own worst tendencies. It reinforces the fallen, we're only human, fallible view of human nature. We continually buy the rope that makes the noose to hang ourselves. Every packet confirms the worst about who we are. Russia makes a virtue of non-necessity by turning an addiction into an indulgence. Can we tell a better story about ourselves? How can we take antisocial behaviors and redirect them? Oh, that's a lovely question. And it does, um... Okay, so addiction is something we don't fully understand uh, in terms of medical knowledge of it and how to, how to fight it. And tobacco addiction is one of the worst ones out there in terms of trying to quit. So anytime somebody tries to quit, only 5% of people are, uh, are able to quit on any one attempt. So usually it takes multiple attempts and it takes all sorts of different methods and, and there's not really an understanding of it. And there is so much shame and blame that comes with tobacco use. And the Soviets, the Soviets in their anti-tobacco campaign, campaigns are just as anti-tobacco as just a, a, an indulgence that is irrational, a luxury and one that endangers others. They're even their 1920s campaigns are about secondhand smoke being a danger and about the danger, the, the waste of uh, energy, or the, you can see some of these are some 1960s ads for anti-tobacco and it's all danger and scare tactics and it focused on the individual making poor choices. Um, yet at the same time, they're also the origin of one of our most promising anti-tobacco uses, it's um, Cideon, or what's the, the active ingredient in Tabex that they find in 1940s when they're looking for tobacco alternatives during World War II. One of the things they use is the golden rain tree um, leaves. They also use walnut leaves and maple leaves and everything else. They smoke anything they can, but golden rain tree leaves um, activate the same pathways, neural pathways as nicotine in the brain. And so um, it's a really, it's a weird story of back and forth. But yeah, how do we turn that around? I think um, the Soviets didn't do it, but Putin's anti-tobacco campaigns have been seen it being effective 
And I think a lot of that effect is that it is moving towards trying to, instead of demonize smoking, um, trying to make it harder to smoke in places and championing, championing um, healthier lifestyle choices. Um, but it is, it, there always is that shame and blame as part of especially anti-tobacco work. Great, thank you. Um, quick question, were Cuban cigars popular in the USSR after 1960? They do, um, they do bring in some, they're such luxury items though. And most people are, most people are smoking whatever they can get. And so Cubans are way up there. Cubans are like the Marlboros, they're mythical. And if somebody gets a box, my favorite thing about Marlboros is people would actually, um, and, and like Cubans, they would just, they would never open the box. The box would just go from people to people to people, you know, just as a gift. You, it, it would slide through the, the, um, uh, the passages of bureaucracy without ever actually being consumed. And so uh, the MacGuffin of, of bribes, it doesn't matter what, what it is. It's never used, but it's always part of the narrative. Um, so, but yeah, the Cubans are, are there, but not, not a mass use item. Um. Thank you. So thanks for such a fascinating presentation. My question is about whether you've come across illegal production of cigarettes in the post-war USSR. Most consumer goods that were in short supply were produced by underground manufacturers in one way or another. Were there fake Marlboros the same way that there were, for example, fake Levi's or fake Lee jeans? Thanks. That's an excellent question. And there are. Um, there are um, after hours producing production. So a tobacco factory would produce on the off hours overnight and then sell that as black market in the late 80s and into the 90s. Um, there's also um, smuggling. So Western manufacturers knowing that their goods are more addictive and also more um, desirable will smuggle through. Um, and so there's a lot of tobacco smuggling, but then there's also yeah a lot of um, falsification a lot of fake stuff out there. Or what's amazing to me is there's also this entire internal logic of which Marlboros that were produced either in Eastern Europe or in Russia were seen as a lower class of Marlboros than the Marlboros that were produced in the West and brought in for, through the Beryozki. And then there's also even within like Yava that are produced in Moscow are better than the Yava that are produced in Saratov. And so there's this, we think about Soviet, you know, the, we think about all of this, oh, the quality wasn't great. And so there's no connoisseurship, there's no interest in that. But no, I, I think there's a really active idea of stratification of goods and what goods are good and what goods are bad and how you understand that, that does make for Soviet connoisseurs, people that knew what they were smoking and knew what it meant to have these differences and talked about it and, and luxuriated in it. And so I do think, yeah, there are all of those things of falsification, black marketing, after hours production, um, but there's also this weird internal market as well. Um, thank you. And the next question actually comes from someone I studied abroad with uh, in Petersburg, a few well over a decade ago, but um, in the early 1990s, there was a political push in the US to prohibit tobacco advertisements targeting children. For instance, this led to the demise of the animated Joe Camel character. Was there similar legislation in the Soviet Union or Russia? That's so, that's so funny because I was just looking at New Pogadi the other day, the, the, the um, rabbit and the wolf, and the wolf smokes well into the 2000s. And so, you know, this is a kid's cartoon and he's just puffing away the entire time. And so there is an attempt, there are some attempts to go after advertising in the 90s, but um, the uh, 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 manufacturers are highly involved in the legislation. And so it's pretty toothless. And I was there in the 90s too, and you could just get tobacco anywhere. And there were also, um, so there were internet um, advertising campaigns that were largely aimed at children talking about school age kids and how, you know, they were not about tobacco per se, but they were hosted by tobacco manufacturers and this was a soft entry. But then you would go to major events and there were just the young women who would be walking around handing out cigarettes um, and to anybody and everybody who wanted one. And the thing about tobacco is 50% of users end up addicted. 
I mean, it's just, you, you, you do. It's, it's, a, it's a very addictive and it can be addictive from the first one. Um, and we don't understand entirely why. Some people can't quit. Um, and it's, again, it's biology and psychology and social and culture. We just don't have the, the mechanisms to understand that. And so it is highly addictive. And um, once you get a kid hooked, that's, it's harder for them to quit. Um, and so that's the main, manufacturers know that if they hook people before 18, they're much more likely to be lifelong smokers. And so they really try to market to kids as much as possible. Um, here's another question. Was there ever a, a demand among Soviet smokers for Western tobacco products that were not made under license in Soviet Union, but actually produced in the West? My oh. experience in Romania in the 1980s and early 90s um, was that Kent cigarettes were the cigarettes of choice because they were considered truly Western, made in the West using Western American tobacco. Same in Russia of the 2000s as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, there are definitely the brands that come in um, as part of um, as part of the um, post-war era, uh, uh, Americans send in huge amounts of, um, as, as part of the Marshall Plan, one of the major things that is sent in is tobacco. And so a lot of that tobacco, it doesn't make it into, of course, the, you know, the Eastern Bloc and Russia, uh, the Soviet Union directly, but it filters its way through and Winston cigarettes. I ran into there. One of my um, my um, Russian collaborator on some of the data. He was a devoted Winston smoker, and he had been a devoted Winston smoker for decades. And uh, even though he couldn't, I'm sure, get Winston all of those times, but it was for him. It was the taste of the West. <laughs> um, the this has just been so interesting. Um, I have one question to kind. Of, to throw in there um, that I just saw along the way, you mentioned the Carmen um, brand of cigarettes and I saw in there Carmen Fabrica and then the Buif Shiva VE As um, Asmola. Was there a time in the Soviet period where they kind of had to say, here's the new factory in a nice Soviet name, but here's like the old name, just in case you were curious where it originally came from. Um, just one neat, cause you think about like 1917, 1921, what happened before is over but it's interesting if that is true that they're keeping little elements during the transition there is there is and uh, asmolov is a great uh, is a great one because asmolov um asmolov goes through many iterations and becomes yeah donskaya gasa um dgtf uh, it's a big factory throughout um and they're one of the factories in Rostov, they go through some real um, problems during World War II. One of my favorite chapters of the book actually is about what happens in World War II, because there's just so much. They, they actually move tobacco factories as part of the evacuation. Again, not an essential part of war, but they, they move over a dozen tobacco factories as part of the evacuation. Um, and Donska, DGTF is not one, that they move, but it is overtaken and the um, people of Donskaya go on foot and leave. Um, they evacuate on foot and then set up again in Omsk. And um, they set up their, their factory again. And they say when they get to that point, when they set up again, that they're back to Asmolov because they're back to the same techniques that they had used before 1917. So they become, from Osmolov to DGTF, back to Osmolov, and then DGTF again as, when they go back to Rostov. And so they're, they, they, that, that history of what they were keeps on going. And it's the th same for La Firm and St. Petersburg is the highest uh, producer before 17 and they become Uretskaya um, after 17, but they will occasionally call themselves La Firm. And so they go back and forth, forth because when they were La Firm, they were a desired cigarette the world over. There are stories in New York about wanting La Firm and in London wanting the La Firm because that was the cigarette. The, the Russians had the Oriental tobaccos and the most flavorful, most fragrant cigarettes. And so there is that kind of desire to, to have that cachet that they had in the pre-revolutionary period, even into the 1930s. So. Um. Two, two questions I'm gonna to pose together. Where was tobacco grown in the USSR? 
And did Vladivostok remain a location for making of tobacco products? Um, it can be grown all the way up to Archangels. And tobacco is easily grown, especially Mahorka, which is this low grade shag tobacco. Peasants grew Mahorka. They just grew it in their back gardens and would use it themselves. And so it's used everywhere, or it's grown everywhere, but the best is Black Sea Coast and areas of Ukraine. But when they, when they take over Central Asia in the 19th century, they take tobacco seeds with them and grow it along in there in Uzbekistan and Turkestan, et cetera. And yeah, all the way out to Vladivostok. But really the areas of Ukraine and Black Sea are seen as the premier tobacco. And they continue on, but as we have Western manufacturers come in after 91, that kind of nails down where we, where we really see the best tobacco and where we can, where you can do American style tobacco. Um, a follow-up question. So I'm a little unclear on the use of the word demonizing. Why would we not demonize, uh, or why would we not all demonize what is evil? Does shame and guilt result in increases in smoking or is it just not the most effective way to get present smokers to quit? Um, why wouldn't we demonize antisocial and personally destructive behavior. There is almost no upside to tobacco at all, at least organized crime and suburban sprawl zoning have some pluses, but tobacco has none. So what's so wrong demonizing it? I, I think it comes a, back to a kind of a person first language. When we demonize smoking, we don't tend to demonize smoking, we demonize smokers. And, and so and, and when we don't understand addiction and how to help people to quit, in effective means all the time. If we demonize, that's a problem. Instead, instead we want to try and help, right? And whenever, and this is a public health issue mostly, right? It, that we don't try not to, in public health, there is generally the idea that making people ashamed of their actions doesn't actually create the prime motivators for better behaviors. And we're, you see this in the, the um, vaccination campaigns now. The demon, everybody in public health is like, don't demonize anti-vaccine. Try and understand and educate and encourage that those are more effective public health strategies. And so the, I would say that that's the same with tobacco. Go ahead and demonize those um, TT, the transnational tobacco companies, the TTCs, go after them. But when we, we go after smoking, we have to be careful that we're not going after smokers. I had a, a really weird experience in the archive. I think it was 2017. It was right at the beginning of, um, of Putin's anti-tobacco campaign. And I was sitting next to a, a Russian guy and he came back and just was reeking of tobacco. So I knew he had just had his tobacco break. And he leans over and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing a history of tobacco. And he said, I hope you'll be sympathetic to the smokers. Because I think, you know, he was in the, the, the crosshairs of this campaign as somebody who was having a hard time quitting probably. And, to, and most smokers now really want to quit. Like 90% of smokers want to quit but it's so hard to do so. And so that would be my, that's a very long-winded answer to why demonize is I think problematic, but. No, thank you, Trish. Um, I, I think we could talk for days, weeks, months, and years about this topic, especially since I think it affects us both personally because we've all probably been in a room with a smoker um, at various times. And then also just these connections near and far and well, Russia's in the news currently as, as well. So it just <laughs> adds to that. Um, if anyone, I, I think we're done with questions. I, I don't wanna hold Trish too long on the line, um, but thank you again. This was extremely interesting and I look forward to the book in the fall. Oh, thank you. I do too. There's <laughs> gonna be like 60 pictures in it. So there's so many more pictures in there. Excellent. And they're gorgeous. No, this is great. Um, thank you again. This has been just beyond interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for the great questions and challenging and exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day, everyone.